So welcome to our second January 2022nd community call, which is a bit of a variety show. Um, that's what I'm calling it. I did not talk to Ben or Diana about that, but we've got a couple of things going on today. I'm trying to hold all of the threads, of course, as Jennifer just alluded to in 2022, what we're holding on to, what we're letting go of, and how we're sharing that with others as we continue to grow and learn. Diana is going to hold the first part of the community call um, as a town hall, inviting in feedback, sharing with others, and growing in that sense. And then we'll take a little bit of an intermission. Again, I'm making this all up as I go. And then we'll popcorn it to Jean and Sally, who have raised a question for us at Kirkridge that we hold about equitable pricing. And then finally, I'd like to touch base about how COVID-19 is still impacting our work. I think every so often we think we see the light at the end of the tunnel and just much like the rest of the world, we get pulled back into some serious realities and some hard decisions we must make and face into. So that's going to be the flow of the day for the newbies on board. Welcome. We're so happy you're here. If you do have questions, all of us um, are excited to share and learn. So please drop questions in the chat, anyone, or uh, invite us into conversations. We, at the end of this, Ben and I will save about seven to 10 minutes to talk about how else we can engage and what's coming up on our programming calendar. So Diana, I'll just pass it over to you. Thanks, Justine. Proud to be the first act of <laughs> the variety show. Um, I thought I would start us off with a poem, which is um, my favorite these days um, from Amanda Gorman, uh, and it's called Every Day We Are Learning. There's the learning person here. And she writes, every day we are learning how to live with essence, not ease, how to move with haste, never hate. How to leave this pain that is beyond us, behind us. Just like a skill or any art, we cannot possess hope without practicing it. It is the most fundamental craft we demand of ourselves. So, um, I, I think the real power of the RCC and the, is the community is all of you and the potential uh, for the community to learn from one another. Uh, and so much of that happens in this forum, uh, in these community calls, on Mighty Networks. Um, and in addition to the kind of, kind of period of here connections, sharing of stories, being in dialogue. Um, there's also an opportunity to learn from the community as a whole, looking across at trends, patterns, um, uh, across the many retreat centers that make up the RCC community. So we took a first pass at that in the fall of 2020 uh, and did a detailed survey that about 50 um, folks within the community, different retreat centers um, within the community responded to in an effort to kind of get a detailed look at who is, like what are the retreat centers that make up the RCC community? Um, where are they? How long have they been around? How big are they? How much have they contracted um, during COVID? Um, and, you know, what are the um, kind of what are the um, issues that they're facing, that you all are facing, um, and um, what has been your experience in engaging with RCC, uh, and how can RCC um, continue to improve and be a best service to community? Um, so we're planning on doing something similar, um, likely to go out next month. And we want to make a real effort to ensure that um, the survey that we send out is truly community directed, that um, we're asking folks to share data about your centers, 
um, uh, that you want to you, you want to hear about from other centers, right? So it's not just about like responding to the survey, putting data <laughs> into a black box, and um, you know maybe hearing something back or not hearing something back, and then uh, or hearing something back and not having it be particularly useful. Um, so the intent of today's conversation is really to lift up um, what uh, you all want to know about the RCC community. Um, what is the community-wide, or you can think of it as sort of retreat uh, sector, retreat center sector-wide um, information and insight that you would find most useful. And we might find that some of what comes up won't sort of fit itself nicely into a little kind of, you know, multiple choice survey question, um, but we're sort of positioning this within the context of a larger intent for the RCC to really be listening uh, to your voices and needs, and so there might be things that come up that there's other ways that um, RCC may be able to act on some of those inputs. Um, and so then, as mentioned, we'll use um, that we'll use as much as we can to shape the upcoming community survey. So I'm going to share just a couple slides just to give you the nitty gritty um, of um, what we're planning to do. And for those, I'll share my screen in a sec, but for those of you that have a hard time, like myself, seeing a shared screen, you can access the slides right here. Very simple. I'm going to share this. We'll attempt to share the right thing. Let's just make this. Slideshow. That coming through? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the community service. What what is the what is the purpose of it? Um, as mentioned, it's really to learn about um, the state of RCC retreat centers. Um, who are we? Who's participating? What's the, what's going on within your centers? Um, and what are your emerging needs? Uh, and then as mentioned, the other uh, purpose is really to inform RCC's um, ongoing and future community engagement and programming. Um, understanding what you all have gained from RCC, what has worked, what hasn't worked, how can RCC improve, uh, and the types of support and offerings would be most helpful going forward. Um, so what is this actually going to look like? Um, it'll be a survey monkey survey, and we'll try to keep it so it's absolutely no longer than 30 minutes. Even at that, it's hard to get folks to spend much time filling out um, the survey. But so, so that, that um, uh, so, so there's always this question of uh, length of the survey uh, versus and and you know putting everything in there versus versus keeping it short enough to make it accessible for folks. Um, as mentioned, um, uh, a commitment to um, sharing the data back in aggregate form uh, and or anonymized form. There might be some open questions where we kind of anonymize the responses and, sh and share a quotes to kind of give us some texture to uh, folks' responses. Um, again, with the intent that, um, that the information insights are, are, are um, directly applicable to the work and questions that you may be holding. Move this forward somehow. Uh, hold on one second. Trying to figure out. Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to share this now. Um. So, what are some of the kind of animating questions that we're currently holding? So um, I've kind of listed here the kind of our starting point questions for framing the survey. So, um, uh, you know, who is engaging in RCC? What do your centers look like? Age, location, budget size. Um, what, you know, what's the state of you know your um, uh, organization's health, uh, in particular financial sustainability, uh, in light of openings and closings and reopenings and. Uh, managing various, uh, you know, uh, COVID restrictions. Um, and then I think really important to this conversation, what trends um, are shaping your work? What are some of the um, emerging challenges or opportunities that are coming up for your centers? 
Um, and then the last two, you know, about RCC. How are you engaging with RCC? Um, uh, what's been your experience and how can we best serve your needs? Uh, so I'm gonna stop the share so I can see everyone. Excuse me one second. Um, so that's the big picture on the survey. And what I was gonna do now is ask folks to do a little bit of quiet um, journaling about a couple questions, which I'll put in the chat. Um, and then we'll use that as a starting point for brainstorming about um, you know, potential requests for the survey. Before going there, any, um, any clarifying questions or uh, any questions of any kind about, um, about what we're trying to do here? Pretty straightforward. Okay. What do you grab? I, if you happen to have, a, you know, actual writing utensil and a piece of paper, um, uh, we're going to take about um, three minutes. I'll set a timer here and invite you to journal on these uh, two questions that I just put in the chat. So thinking about your centers. What um, what decisions, challenges, or opportunities are on the horizon for your center? And I put allied organization there in case anyone here is not in an actual retreat center. Um, and then could data, or in what ways might data from other retreat centers help you address these particular decisions, challenges, or opportunities? So um, take three minutes to just journal on that a bit, and then we'll start to connect that to potential inputs for the survey.
you can finish up the thought that you're jotting down and just look up when you're ready. And so using your reflections as a starting point, um, would love it if you could share on the Jamboard um, link that I just posted, any information and insights from the RCC that would help advance your center's work. And I've put a bunch of stickies down there. You just kind of grab, um, uh, grab, grab the sticky and type your, um, the information that you're looking for into one of those stickies, which is click on it. If you're having any difficulties with the Jamboard, just go ahead and, and stick um, your response in the chat and um, myself or Ben will, um, I'm offering you up, and we'll transfer that onto the Jamboard. And then we'll see what comes up and have a little discussion about it. And feel free to put as many on there as you'd like. Don't, don't worry about the lines, it makes it creative. These are great. Um, I'd love to dig into um, some, I have some follow-up questions for um, kind of the type of information that would be so helpful on a lot of these. Justine, how, um, when should we be sure to wrap this conversation up by? So I, within about 15 minutes, does that I work? I say 20, so just about right. Up to, up to 20, okay, mm -hmm. um, great. Feel free to keep on adding to this. I'm just gonna, uh, and if you happen, if you're looking at it and you see clusters of um, of stickies, go ahead and cluster them together. That will help us all. Okay, I'm gonna start. Won't go through all of these, but some of these would be helpful to know a little more about. The pricing information and benchmark ratios that strive for in certain financial ratios per event and or per service. Um, 
So is that could could the um, is that around kind of what what is the so, so bench is that benchmark from other centers as to kind of how they think about the um, pricing and um, breaking even or not or <laughs> what, what, say some say a little bit more about um, about that sticky whoever put that. So I, I put that, so I guess just how people approach thinking about uh, financials, um, you know, when making mm -hmm. decisions, what are ratios that you might strive for when making decisions around different types of activities, um, you know, particularly around pricing as an example. So um, how do you, mm -hmm. you know, are you trying to cover X percent by revenues and yeah. Y by fundraising or um, uh, multiple, you know, in-kind donations. And anyways, what are the, you know, are there different kind of, again, just ratios or benchmarks that help guide your decisions? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Helpful. And could that also be kind of thinking about a model for sustainability for the center of whole, we get, as a whole, we, you know, um, expect to do, you know, X percent of retreat opportunities through scholarship. Therefore, we, you know, are seeking this kind of, you know, um, revenue um, for X percent of our retreats in order to, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think you could take it in multiple ways, but yeah. Okay. Helpful. Um, Um, so there's a bunch here on programming. So how to keep um, past visitors involved in wider programmatic work and political movements. Um, does whoever post that want to say a, a word or two about it? And if not, that's okay. Okay, we'll move on to um, this other one, support and flexibility around program platforms. Um, be helpful to hear a little more about what's behind this. What kind of flexibility, what kind of support? Anne, you want to unmute yourself? Is this yours? Um, I think it's very, very helpful for me to hear con pretty consistently how others are trying to do that balance of on-site distance, when mm -hmm. and how to pivot to move from mm -hmm. one form to another to just just keep keep my brain stimulated in terms of how else to look at how we offer programming. Mm -hmm. And in particular, that um, uh, on-site versus remote um, online and, and both. Both, both how to do both. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, were there other, did other folks have um, stickies that were related to that, um, you know, different models of, of programming on site versus um, remote versus hybrid? Okay. Um, there's a few here on staffing. Um, so innovative staffing models best practices uh, and ways to address staffing issues when moving forward with work um, completion. If, if um, either of the folks that put those just kind of want to offer maybe a little bit of texture on um, the, you know, type of, um, you know, ch challenge or, you know, need that um, you're, you're trying to address with this information. So 
So like, could it be around, you know, staff um, having to reduce staff or staff transitioning out, um, director yeah, level transition. I was one of those post-its and with mm -hmm. dual hats, one as the RCC and seeing trends um, mm -hmm. with people in and out of retreat centers, um, Pendle Hills compensation survey. I think it's very timely, you know, as we also read about the great resignation um, and living mm -hmm. wages as a justice issue. So all of that macro. And then I think kind of going back to Anne's question, as we pivot or scale back to opening, how, how can we think creatively about staffing? Mm -hmm. um, for Kirkridge, Jean had lived on campus, I live on campus. What are models that celebrate that? What is co-sharing that work look like? I mean, so there's just so many parts of that, I think, um, mm -hmm. that I could pick into. Yep, yeah. yeah. Um. And then that could relate to, not necessarily, but could relate to policy examples, e.g. updated COVID policies. Um, again, with this one, be great to know kind of the particular, you know, challenge need opportunity um, that this would get at. And I'm looking for a, kind of another level of granularity here, because when you're thinking about how do you frame a question in a survey, the, the more <laughs> specific you can get, the, you know, more, more helpful um, the data can be um, in aggregate. I did not put that one up, but I did put a COVID policy one up that appears to have disappeared. Um, and oh, I would, well, um, or COVID plan, um, safety plan. Um, I would say that I'm really interested in how other places are handling things like meals. If you do shared meals, if you do um, shared, uh, if you have shared bathrooms, if you have shared common spaces, what are you, how are you handling um, and approaching, I actually think this summer may be more difficult than last summer for us um, because of the way the variants are going. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So particular around that sort of those shared spaces, meals, common spaces, rooms, bathrooms. Outdoor versus indoor activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually could relate in some interesting ways to some of the, these different kind of pro programming models that we were talking about earlier, I think, with, um, with, with Deborah, Deborah. For sure. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. So there could be a whole section on like what, you know, ways, cr cr creative modes of, of, of programming, you know, on-site on hybrid distance. Um, there's a couple here around um, pooled resources, uh, healthcare, um, uh, willingness to share the resources like programming. Um, would uh, other the folks that posted those like to give some voice to the can kind of guess, but the uh, op you know opportunity uh, or um, you know that you see here that would be helpful to add some detail on. I was the one who put down the one on pooled healthcare. Um, and it's just a real wonderment. Um, you know, would, how could a larger center or how could a center that maybe is supported by people who do healthcare um, really support other centers? Because the extraordinary expense of trying to do healthcare for three or four people is, 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 is gastronomical. And so how is it that, that we might creatively think about going in together as pulled as an RCC total mm -hmm. group as an option, okay. at least for basic, very basic healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, it's kind of uh, testing um, interest, openness level and maybe any, any barriers to, to, to that. Yeah, and maybe even for a center, it might be beneficial. It might be a small income stream. Mm -hmm. 
And then there was a related, um, another kind of resource sharing one here, and, and it's an EG Health Insurance as well as programming, which also relates to the sticky um, that says health on marketing efforts for programs, opportunities to have shared conversation about what is happening um, at our, our centers and kind of best practices around marketing. Am I understanding that correctly? It's really kind of exchange of kind of what's going on and what, what's, what, what's working um, and what's challenging on the marketing front. Would the person that um, added that sticky like to give voice to it? Fine, it's no, no problem if not, of course. Okay, let's just go through and touch on a few more of these. We talked about staffing. Um, okay, so then there's um, a few here. Actually, this could relate deep exploration of collaboration opportunities. This kind of gets to the um, Jean's point on health insurance and expands it out. So um, really broad collaboration, shared staff, shared programming, shared leadership. Um, that's that's compelling. Would love Diana, to I wrote, Diana, I wrote that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really don't think we've pushed the edges enough at all. I think we're just beginning to form the trust that then can push the edges. So I really would love to hear um, people just do, just throw paint on the wall of potential collaboration ideas that really would create a much stronger group and, um, And, and better impact, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, just as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, I'm starting to see this survey differently than I did at first. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a gathering of where we are, but could it could be, be a, it could be a snapshot of where we could be. Mm -hmm. So. I'm envisioning a kind of a, a radical imagining of you know future possibilities. Section Absolutely, what? Yeah. Love it. I, um, I, I just go I can, ahead. Uh, yeah, I can echo that. I've heard this from other parts of our circle too, Jean. So you're not alone. And there are different ways that people are phrasing it. Some people are talking about a deep bench of facilitators, but then also they're talking about yeah, pooled healthcare, but then also talking about what about somebody who can manage our HR or can manage our IT? And so we don't have to think about that. We can focus on the stuff that we feel like we're, we're better at or have more you know, experience and skills in. And, let's, and then we can lean all together on someone who's really good at this piece that's missing for us. So yeah, I think, there's a, I think Jean's right. There's a lot of ways that we could push our edges as we kind of work with the trust that we're building. I just want to touch on three remaining um, areas on the gym board here. So there's um, so, uh, land stewardship, governance, and then partnerships, um, and then anything else that folks want to be sure to give voice to. Um, so there are a couple here on stewarding lands. So stewarding lands with extension offices, uh, higher ed programs, Native American projects, and then um, and other people on how people are stewarding their land, what has, hasn't worked. Um, any additional nuance that folks who put those stickies would, um, would like to add? And I'm thinking then about kind of how this might interact with the um, land legacies uh, uh, work that's ongoing. Yeah, I'm curious if there's more to the question here. Our Land Legacies upcoming series is going to address that sticky pretty comprehensively, I think. Um, but at the same time, it's a huge topic. 
with many, many different ways to get involved. And every center is positioned differently with different communities nearby that, that you can build relationships with. So there's no one, <laughs> one answer, but we're, we're trying to, to go that direction with our upcoming Land Legacy series, which you can find more on our website. And we'll be talking more about it later uh, in this call as well. Does anyone want to add voice to either of those those points? Um, what I think we can do with the surveys, maybe get a read on, you know, to what extent folks are, you know, have, um, to what extent it is a sort of a central issue, and then um, in what ways is that being addressed or con um, considered? I'm sorry, was someone going to speak? I also just, for the way you responded to that, I think about scenario planning, how far are people in their process? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about if they are selling their land, um, decolonizing their work, like what is mm -hmm. that, what has that progress been? And maybe for us in the RCC looking, matching that data from the initial survey about I think we also asked them about eco justice values, so that comparison would be interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Justine. Um, so then there's two over here. Um, one, one says innovative partnerships. I'd love to hear more about kind of again what the challenge or opportunity is behind that one. And then there's one that could be related, thinking outside the box, working with local partners to help increase access such as uh, daycare for retreatants. That sounds like a potential example of an innovative partnership. Would love to hear a little more about kind of the challenges or opportunities that folks are seeing within their centers that this sort of information would help address. Just the one that offered the daycare example. I'm very curious if other people we always talk about intergenerational learning and creating various access points. I want to know for some retreat centers what those access points are for those um, who traditionally have not retreated or not retreated in many of the retreat centers that are in the RCC. So specifically those who have been marginalized or minoritized, um, what are the innovative ways to create additional access points? Hmm. Thank you. I might just add to it. Another idea that I've heard is um, how could retreat centers partner with corporate wellness programs? Um, and particularly if you think of RCC as a network of centers, how could we connect with a corporate wellness program that would offer some sort of benefit to retreat centers across the country? Really an interesting idea. Uh, very different mm -hmm. from how we usually speak and not necessarily based on equity, um, but I'm curious what it could bring up. It, and it you know, could actually connect in interesting ways to uh, the initial uh, um, point that we discussed from Brian around different um, financial models uh, and thinking about, you know, what are the, um, you know, kind of full revenue opportunities and how does that um, relate, you know, to help subsidize some uh, other opportunities for greater access. Um, the, and then just the last one, it's um, uh, one, it's the person who put um, down the sticky on models of governance, particularly uh, where to engage community partners. Um, would love to hear more about that. There's a lot we could ask on governance models. So that was me. It was as much connected to the innovative partnerships, but mm -hmm. um, so as we're getting going in the Avila Center, we actually are trying to create um, a governance model where uh, we have some shared ownership of some uh, partners. Um, so groups who will be using it, but who are active in the decision-making process as we're doing things around operations and uh, uh, decision-making. And so um, for me, it's, it's more than how do we, yeah, more around innovative partnerships around governance so that it is uh, a deeper level of involvement by 
partners who are wanting to also co-create a much mm -hmm. larger vision than simply using it in, as a retreat center for themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Um, anything that um, we have not touched on that folks would like to give voice to? What has been left unsaid? Diana, maybe we could have a raffle of who could pick the date when we might be coming out of this and we could all put in some money so that we could see, you know, when, when we might be back on a little more solid ground. What do you think? Well, um, I did not plan that um what Jean just said but i was gonna i did intend on asking you all if there are um what, anything we could do to help encourage you and your sort of peers at other retreat centers to take the survey any kind of any barriers would be helpful to know about or you know tactics um that um especially you know fun future visioning <laughs> like Jane just mentioned, that would help um, grow our, our response rate. Because of course, the more responses we have, the more powerful this whole thing will be. I, I don't know if this follows up on what Jean said, but um, I guess one of the things that I keep thinking about is um, there's a new normal that we're going to be moving into or that we are in right now. And so I guess my big question is, what do we do to live and operate in that? How and, mm -hmm. and a lot of ideas have been given, and I guess it is that looking forward. But how do we operate differently? How do we plan differently? Um, because where I'm coming from is I see the need for us to move. Um, and we can keep waiting for things to bounce back, but they're not going to. Um, I think this is with us. So how do we live with this? What, what does this mean for us as retreat centers? And how must we be different? And how can we be different um, in order to provide for the needs of people? Thank you. I think that's a wonderful recap of, um, of much of this conversation. And it's been extraordinarily helpful for me specifically in shifting from an understanding about the now to um, a looking towards the future and how to support retreat centers in, in, in transitioning to that future, which as Jane Marie was saying, is already here. So thank you. Um, uh, you will be seeing the survey in an inbox near you. Um, I would say um, probably, we're trying to uh, space it out. There is the, um, um, racial healing initiative surveys out now, so we don't want to overwhelm folks, um, but probably towards the end of, of February. Uh, and then, and Justine and I will also kind of make sense of this conversation, because I think there's some rich opportunities for community call discussions in the mix here as well, with gratitude. Can I, Back can to you. Yeah, can I also <laughs> offer a suggestion on, on the setting up of the survey? Um, mm -hmm. The shorter the statements are, I think the better response you're going to get. Um, yeah. Because with all due respect, Ben, the one you just sent out to us, it was hard to read. And I could not do it in 30 minutes. <laughs> I completely understand. Yes. So I think you will get more response if it, there are shorter things that you can write or respond to. And people don't have to do an abundance of reading. I, that's just a suggestion. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jane Marie. And also, I just want to call out thank you for modeling the sort of candid feedback that is really actionable um, uh, and, and, and helpful to hear directly. Yeah, thank you, Sister Jane Marie. Thank you, everyone, for being so generative in that conversation, in Act One, as Diana said. Um, we do have a little over 30 minutes for uh, two and three. And it doesn't mean if we don't get to it today, we're not, we're never going to, as Diana just said, that you also not only gave us some insights into how to hold that survey, but how to hold the community and what our needs are as we look for um, planning our community calls and other touch points to including conversations on our mighty network. Um, if you are not part of that, Brian, I think you just joined today, uh, please do so and pop in those questions. Two of the questions that we're going to look at now came from conversations um, and we've already touched on them. So Sally and Jean, I had asked you, one of the questions we're holding at Kirkridge, um, I had asked you to bring this to the community call and I'll just pass it back over to you thinking we have about 15 minutes or so with it. Well, it's delight. I'm delighted to be here. And um, I am on staff at Kirkridge along with Justine and Sally is on our board. And as we begin, I just, I just want to take, have us take a breath. We're not going to get through this, but we'll at least maybe give Diana some more questions for her survey. So it's, it's a, a very famous Rilke quote, but it's so apropos. Be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Like lock rooms, like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not seek the answers which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. So it's my understanding that we're gonna talk about program and program pricing. Is that right, Justine? Okay, that is living the questions. And um, I want you to think just for a minute, um, there's been enormous struggle around this pandemic, enormous struggle. But what is it that you've learned or been able to answer that you held as a question before the pandemic and now you've lived into the answer as we're living into, in the pandemic? Anybody? I'll, I'll give you an example for, for Kirkridge. Kirkridge had no idea. First of all, we live with a lift, an elevator lift that does not work. And it does not work because it's so old. And it's so old, we can't get it tested. And to get it tested costs $4,000. And so we live without the lift. So the question for Kirkridge is, how do we make this place accessible? How is it accessible? A question we always had is, how is it affordable? And a question we had was, how do we hang on to um, our elders or people who have moved away or who can't just geographically get here anymore because it's so expensive? So those were the questions. COVID and the pandemic helped us live into the answer overnight. We would have never, we would have fought it tooth and nail, which was to move to Zoom. So I, I would really love to hear what, what were the questions you as an organization held before the pandemic? And have you found any answers during the pandemic? I feel like our experience at Dominican Center kind of right uh, aligns right along with what Jean was sharing. Um, you know, it's not even so much that we had a question about how we would do this. We just never thought of doing it, which was um, all of our spiritual formation courses. Um, 
we always had the facilitators and the presenters in person and people would drive into the center and there's a nine nine month you know course commitment and that's just all that we knew um so when we thought about that's that's the essence of who we are you know dominican spirituality and formation um we wanted to make sure that we kept our essence and part of that is how how do we now make that accessible to our participants and we um, we pivoted quite quickly and it took quite a bit of um, effort um, and working together in communication and, you know, moving things along, but we were able to transition all of our formation programs to Zoom, to using the virtual experience. And we've been able to continue to offer that and have found out to receive now probably more registrations now for them than when we offered them in person um, because we're not limited by space anymore. So that was one of the good things that we found. And then off of that, we started doing all of our other programmings. How do we do this virtually? So um, I wanna say that's probably one of the biggest highlights that COVID kind of pushed us into. Um, but I also feel like that's probably true for a lot of, a lot of your centers. Thank you, Yolanda. This isn't so much a question we had prior to, but it's maybe a reality that has been emphasized for me with COVID. Um, we are located on the mother house property of our sisters, so we are not standalone. And I think what has been emphasized for me is that there are some real serious issues and problems that can arise when you are not standalone. And how do you move through those and how are others moving through those? And I guess that's probably one of the demographic questions I would suggest is, are you standalone or are you Mm -hmm. connected because mm -hmm. we have found through COVID that it has a tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many things we cannot do because we are not standalone. And we probably could move much faster, but we can't. So that's one of the things that has really been emphasized for us. Well, one of the things we oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's, let's. I think one of the big pivots for Manresa has been forever. People believed that spiritual companioning or spiritual direction had to be two people in the same room, the same space. That, that myth has literally been busted. What we just did a couple of weeks ago is we offered a couple of sessions on how to help our spiritual directors and companions become more comfortable doing that kind of soul work over some sort of social media platform, be it Zoom or FaceTime or Skype. Um, I would have never anticipated that this would be a facet of our internship. But as we're forming new companions and directors, both myself and my co-partner are deliberately helping them envision never meeting somebody face to face. And it's, it's just been such a powerful experience of saying, not only can we do this, but look at the impact. It used to be if you had a spiritual director and your director moved across the country, you'd have to find somebody else. It's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. So I think COVID has been such a, a reorientation for us in just this very small, slender way. If I could add one, one more thought that came to me, um, I think being part of the retreat center collaborative has also, um, I would hope, um, has shifted the way of thinking and viewing things. 
um, it has for us at Dominican Center. You know, we realize we are not in competition with any other retreat center. We're only in competition with, with, with ourselves and, and, and who we were yesterday, who, were, who we were a year ago, and how do we move forward. So I think the spirit of collaboration um, is, is very much um, alive for Dominican Center, and we are open to um, talking to different you know, institutions or centers or anything that aligns with, with what, we're, what we're hoping to put out there as far as projects go. Um, and we, we see, we look around to see who, who would be our allies, who could we partner with um, to move this forward and to have a bigger impact. Um, whereas I, I like to say before COVID, it was just, this, this is our focus right now, rather than reaching out and exploring all of these other possibilities that could be out there for us. So um, that's probably got to be um, one of the most meaningful, at least for me, um, from where I stand. Thanks, Yolanda. You know, Sally, I'm going to turn this over to you because Sally, at the beginning of this, I mean, Sally always is thinking of potential and outside the box and kind of sometimes pushes us there. Um, but I really want to talk to you about, I want you to talk, share about what, where we started with pricing and what we've learned. Jane, um, for me, first of all, it doesn't make any sense that I'm in love with Kirkridge. I live on the coast of South Carolina. I'm closer, Brian, to your center than I am to Kirkridge, but I am in love with Kirkridge. Um, and I've served Kirkridge as a board member and as a facilitator and as a participant of retreats. Never, I've never lived there. So I do have a, a bit of a different perspective and I had the, um, the privilege and the shock of being the final facilitator before COVID. I was facilitating a retreat that second week in March of 2019. And literally from the time I got on a plane in Pennsylvania until the time I got off a plane in South Carolina, I felt like the world had changed. I had no idea that on Monday, um, the, that next Monday that Jean and Justine, because of the governor's orders, would have to shut the place down. And like everybody else, I thought it was temporary. I met Jean because she and I are both circle of trust facilitators and have worked with Parker Palmer and others across the world in circles of trust. And when she invited me to come and co-facilitate a circle of trust at Kirkridge with her, I jumped at the chance but not because I wanted to go to Kirkridge or a retreat center, but because I love doing circles of trust. So I came kicking and screaming to the idea that you could do circles of trust on Zoom. I did not think that that was possible. Now I have come so far in the other direction that I don't ever want to totally give up Zoom. Um, what I have really learned over these last two years, and I'm still learning, is what um, probably Carl Jung and physicists and many others talk about as consciousness and our ability to be together when we're not together. And I feel like Zoom is giving us the chance to learn more about that and to practice that. For the reasons that Jean's already named, um, that we now have people coming to programs at Kirkridge who would never have come if it hadn't been on Zoom because they're in Australia or because they're in their 90s and they can no longer travel or because they didn't see coming to a retreat center in the Poconos as a safe place for them. Um, I don't ever want to give up Zoom, but I think and, and my own background is in higher education. So I'm on a lot of list service with others in higher ed and public ed. What I hear us talking about in those fields, and now I hear us talking about an RCC, is that the new normal, as somebody else already mentioned, is probably going to be some combination 
of online and on land. I don't like the word hybrid because I grew up in South Carolina and South Carolina hybrid is a mule and nobody wants to be a mule. Um, and the schools have really destroyed hybrid with what they've done to teachers because they've treated it as if you could teach in online and on land the same way at the same time. And I know that you can't, but I do think that there are ways to synchronously do online and on land and that that is our future. So I'm, I'm really excited about it and really committed to that. And what does all this have to do with pricing? Um, when Kirkridge shut down, we immediately just said, we won't charge for anything. We don't really know what we're doing. We don't want to charge anything. If we screw up, you know, nobody's lost anything. So that's what we did for the first year. Everything was free. Then the second year, when we realized there was going to be a second year, we got a little bit panicky about how are we going to pay the bills because we still can't reopen and we need to charge for some, some stuff for something. But we loved that we had been generous and we had talked about generosity of spirit and we had invited people to make donations and some did. So the second year, we tried to change the language a little bit to say, this is actually what it's costing us, even though we're not open for programs, we still have to maintain the buildings, we still have to pay the staff, we still have to make some money. Um, here's what we'd like, we ask that you pay, and we ask that you pay more if you can. And we, and we say, we don't ever want you to not come because you can't pay. So it's, it's complicated, it's sticky. And now as we think about online and on land, I'm sort of pushing for that it would cost the same for the program, whether you took it online or on land, and that the dip because it's the same program, that the difference would be if you came on land, you would obviously pay room and board cost. But I love, Jean, that you started with Rilke, because I feel like we're living into those questions. We certainly have no answers. So let me stop there and see if you have answers or more questions. Well, I'm, I'm clear that we're up to almost our 15 minute mark, I, but I want to, I, I want to leave you with this thought. And I think uh, Justine and Ben, we probably need a longer conversation about pricing. We have about five more minutes. I oh, okay. I'll respond about COVID since we didn't get to it today. And then Ben will close us out. So we have five minutes. I'd love to hear other people's perspectives and then Jean, you can continue with the closing. Okay, why don't we do that? So what are other people's learnings around pricing and conundrums and questions? And maybe we'll just take note of those so that we can address them at another point. Can I jump in and just say that jumping into this organization, a big thing that I am struggling with, and by the way, thank you to everybody who's been contributing. This has been really great to listen to, um, and I'm so happy to be here, but is, um, is equity and how we make, um, and I heard somebody mention this affordable, but you know, our, um, uh, we have a long history of a lot of amazing social justice movements working out of this facility. Um, but as we continue to have to maintain buildings that are falling apart and all of those things, um, we have to, you know, increase rates, um, how are we balancing that with making sure that we want to make sure that people who don't have um, the same wealth or income can come and that's a lot of social justice warriors. So <laughs> um, yeah, that's big struggle. I share um, that we at Dominican Center are playing around and beginning to explore um, what it might mean to be able to be of service to the community while also reaching out to different institutions who might have a need for a particular program or service that, that we might be able to provide to be able to do maybe some co-sponsoring uh, of such programs. 
um, so that they are made accessible to, to those who need it. So we are starting to um, explore those things and maybe it, it also be worth um, looking into. Something with your microphone was cutting in and out, Yolanda. I caught about half of what you said. I'm sorry. Maybe we can get one or two comments and then I'd like to, and then I'd actually like to kind of close it out. I think for us, and I live in a very, very wealthy neighborhood. And most of our retreatants and folks who come to our programs are people of means. And what we noticed is when we first had to adjust for COVID, like many places and organizations and other groupings were offering lots and lots of things online for free, just, just sign up and come, let's stay in touch. And what we've discovered is that that wasn't always the best practice and policy for us that people could afford that asking for a donation and a lot of it is now donation based but we ask we we basically say we we need you to support us concretely physically dollars without saying this program is going to be two hundred dollars or five dollars but there's been a growing shift of responsibility. You know, a, one group that met for 10 times with about 10 people, the total donation was a total of $50. And we said, whoa, something's out of kilter here. And so we're looking at nominal charges for most of our programming now, really believing that for our demographics, people can afford to help support us to keep our doors open. Okay. Thanks, um, Anne. I think we've learned by experience that just to say, y'all come, no charge, is not in the long run a good idea for us. Great. Bernadette, you had your hand up. Yeah, so we've, we've been trying to address a lot of these issues um, through program pricing in two ways. One, we started using Retreat Guru uh, plat as a registration application last July. And one of the things that allows us to do on every single registration is there's a section asking for donations. And within the first two months, we received over $1,500 in donations just people adding another 25 bucks onto their registration. I mean, it's that's been beautiful. Um, and they can choose between supporting the general running of the place or between sc and scholarships. So that's that's been highly successful. And the other thing that uh, in the past, we were able to make sure that we, part of Crown Lake's mission is to make sure that everyone has access to retreat center time. Uh, it's one of our core uh, purposes. Um, and in the past, we were able to do that through our partnerships with other nonprofits in the area. So you're running a homeless shelter over there, you bring your guys over here to be part of our conversation around homelessness or around whatever. Those groups can't do that anymore because their staff has been blown away and their guys can't come to the shelter in the pandemic. So um, in order to try to um, continue to have folks come who are not people of means. Uh, we've really upped our game on offering scholarship aid so that every program, it's out there, it's right there. If you need scholarship aid, please request here. And we've, we've seen a, a huge increase uh, in that. And we've sought very pointedly in our, um, in our grant writing for scholarship aid to be, so I have a lovely little pool that I keep drawing from for folks with that. Great, thank you, Bernadette. Nice to have you as a neighbor. You're really close. I know where you are <laughs> and been there. Um, I just really quickly, Justine, I'll do it really fast to kind of wrap us up. Um, one of the things I want to address is, um, Octavia, you, you talked about how helpful this is. I, I want us all to be shameless about 
looking at other people's websites. You learn from what other people have tried and what they're putting out regarding scholarships, bursaries, whatever, about how do they word it. That that you know, you know, if we're collaboration, we we get to work together as collaborative. So so look to someone who looks like you and try and see what they're saying about how they're doing pricing. Um, I'm shameless about that. Um, for for um, Yolanda, you talked about community. You know, um, there is a fair amount of money in your county to service local groups. And we, it, Kirkridge has two contracts now and maybe growing into another one, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and it is that it becomes money that comes in for a, a generalized use. And that moves into partnerships versus all these individualized programs that we used to do. So um, just to raise that, that um, bar. And then here's just the last thing I'm gonna say. I had a conversation with a board member this morning and she was telling me about endowment gifts and her former board chair who was dying and she was having one of his final conversations with him. And, and she said, you know, it is really, it's so important, you know, that, that we, that we have these endowment gifts and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I, you know, Jim, I, I can talk to you candidly. Have you ever thought about leaving anything to, to this agency? And he said, well, I never thought of that. It's like, it's up to us to ask. And if we don't ask, People assume we don't need it. So Anne, in your community, you need to make a statement of why it's important to commit this center and what have you done? And people give to mission and you've done plenty. And our annual appeal is stunning. Absolutely stunning. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's, that's fabulous. And that's where some of these, um, when we say we're offering it for free, at least I've noticed it showed up in annual donations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justine. Thank you, Ben, for the invitation. We need, to, it, it, as we live the questions, we're going to have more. I see some great opportunities for folks to connect off of this call to one on one if, if there are things you want to learn from another specific center. Or, and I hear some people talking about neighbors too. So if you have a neighbor geographically, uh, that's something that you can look into too. Um, Justine, am I a green light for announcements? Are we, we're kind of at that point in the call? Okay, we have, we have five the minutes. The curtain left. is on its way to being closed. Yeah, the red, the red curtain is closing on there. I won't give you the hook though, but. Okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to share a couple things in the chat, uh, just things for you to jump to and, and get to later this week. Um, I'll be sending out some emails about this as well. Uh, the first one is, uh, as already mentioned, the racial healing initiative has sent out a retreat center assessment, which is a very in-depth survey um, and will take 30 minutes, if not a little more, but it is so helpful for the RCC to see where different retreat centers are on a continuum of racial equity and healing work. What have you done? Where is your growing edge? Um, what would you like to learn? Um, where are the challenges or obstacles or, or unique opportunities in your community? Uh, that that assessment is invaluable for us to put together a curriculum and begin the pilot of that program, which will then scale out to more and more centers um, where we'll be able to offer racial healing retreats at many retreat centers around the country. So if you can contribute to that survey, we would be so appreciative. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that Land Legacies, another topic that came up um, earlier in the call, is an education series for retreat centers um, looking at land stewardship, and it also has a lot to do with equity and a lot to do with intergenerational and ancestral and legacy. How are we living into the promise of what a retreat center can be both now and ahead of us after we step away? Um, so that first session is going to be February 2nd and registration is open until then. So if your center is interested in attending or if you have folks on your staff that you'd like to send, um, it's one registration fee for everyone on staff um, and the sessions will be recorded so you'll have access to. Um, we also have a couple more community calls coming up in February. The first one, February 8th, will be a two hour workshop with our racial healing initiative 
uh, consultants. So we've hired five consultants, um, extraordinary people with a lot of talent and experience, and a couple of them will be pairing up to offer um, a workshop uh, once a month for the next few months. So our next community call will be one of those workshops. So I'm excited for that. And then we'll be hearing from Pearlstone, another retreat center in the RCC based on the East Coast. We'll be hearing from them and what they've learned and how they've pivoted during the pandemic on the community call February 22nd. So just kind of a heads up that those are coming down the pike. Any other announcements from this community that we wanna share with each other, things that are on the horizon? Questions uh, coming out of all the things we covered today. <laughs> um, I know I mentioned this Racial Healing Initiative Retreat Center Assessment, which is a survey and a very in-depth survey. We're gonna to try to use some of the demographics data from that survey and combine that with the information we'll be gathering from a larger community survey next month. So hopefully uh, we won't be barraging you with some of the same questions, but trying to synthesize all this data that we're gathering. And we try to do this once a year, uh, but sometimes there's just too many good things that we wanna do and to do them well, we need to know more of who's involved and what they need and what they want. So thanks for being a part of the conversation today, which will be super helpful for us as we design the survey going forward. Appreciate you being here. Thank All right. You. Have a good day. Be well. Take care. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank yeah. you, Jesse. Thank, Thank you, Dan. You